Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains mostly correct, and today we are going to do a video that I wasn't planning on doing, but due to an error I made, I felt it was appropriate for me to discuss this. In my most recent top five, when I discussed Worst Plates Ever and talked about the DC-10, I incorrectly stated that one of the accidents was caused by the cargo door issue. Now, that issue was an actual problem and did cause more than one accident. However, the crash of Flight 191 actually wasn't caused by it. This was due to my fault. I completely misread one of my sources, and I don't like doing that. I don't like getting things wrong, but it does happen, and I would like to correct it. I've already clipped out the section of the recent video where I mentioned Flight 191 so as not to confuse future viewers, but for those of you who have watched that video already, I wanted to do an actual proper analysis of the crash, so we talk about the facts of what happened rather than me just completely flubbing my script. So, this is the story of the worst American air disaster in history, the crash of Flight 191. American Airlines Flight 191 was, well, an uh, air flight that was scheduled to fly from O'Hare International Airport in Chicago, Illinois, to Los Angeles International Airport in Los Angeles, California. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas DC-10. This particular DC-10 was N110AA. It had been delivered to the airline on February 25th, 1972, and up until that point, it had logged just under 20,000 hours of flying time. It was powered by three General Electric CF6-6D engines. On the day of the flight, May 25th, 1979, the flight crew was Captain Walter Lux, who was age 53, who had been flying the DC-10 since its introduction. He himself had 22,000 flying hours of experience, and 3,000 of those were in DC-10s. The first officer was James Dillard, age 49, and the flight engineer was Alfred Udovich, age 56. They each had about 9,275 hours and 15,000 hours of flight time, respectively, and between them, they had about 1,830 hours of flying experience in DC-10s. All was normal as Flight 191 taxied out to the runway. The control tower radioed that they were clear for takeoff, and Captain Walter Lux threw the throttle forward in order to get underway. However, just as the plane reached takeoff speed, its number one engine and the pylon assembly separated from the left wing. This wasn't a clean break either. It ripped away a three-foot section of the leading edge of the wing, and the entire unit actually flipped over the top of the wing and landed on the runway. The sudden damage to the wing also caused significant interruption into the plane's hydraulic systems. On top of that, the number one electrical bus, whose generator was attached to the engine, failed, resulting in many electrical systems on the plane going offline. Without the hydraulics in the wing, the leading edge slats locked in place, which caused the outboard slats to retract under load. This raised the stall speed of the left wing to about 159 knots. This is six knots higher than the prescribed takeoff safety airspeed of 153 knots. This caused the left wing to enter a full aerodynamic stall, which is a situation in which a plane can no longer maintain lift and begins to fall out of the sky. Without the left wing supplying lift, the aircraft began to bank left, rolling over onto its side, nearly inverting it at a 112 degree bank angle. Power to the in-flight recorder was actually lost when the engine ripped off so we don't actually know exactly what was said or done during the final moments of Flight 191. But it can be assumed that the crew did everything they could to regain control of the airplane. Flight 191 slammed into a field about 4,600 feet, or 1,400 meters, from the end of the runway. Massive sections of the aircraft were hurled from the impact point into an adjacent trailer park, which destroyed five trailers and several cars. The aircraft was completely obliterated, spilling and igniting nearly a full load of 21,000 gallons of fuel. Out of the 258 passengers and 13 crew members, there were no survivors. All 
271 people died in the accident. Additionally, two employees of a nearby repair garage were also killed by flying debris, and two more were severely injured, bringing the total death toll to 273 people. What in the world happened? Why on earth did Flight 191's engine just fall off of it? Was it the cargo door issue? Well, no. Like I said when I started this video, this accident, as bad as it was, had nothing to do with that particular flaw. That flaw would cause other accidents, but not this one. And in fact, this accident had little to do with the DC-10's design overall. This wasn't necessarily a fault with the base aircraft. This was a fault with American Airlines' maintenance protocols. The National Transport Safety Board launched an investigation, trying to determine exactly what had happened. But given there was not much of the aircraft left to analyze, this was a very tall order. Fortunately, they were able to figure out exactly what happened due to witness accounts and examining American Airlines' maintenance records. This particular DC-10 had been in a maintenance facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma, between March 29th and March 30th, 1979. On those dates, it had experienced routine maintenance, which is totally normal, but the number one engine had been removed from the wing for inspection and some light tune-up work. The removal procedure that was recommended by McDonnell Douglas called for the engine to be detached from the pylon before detaching the pylon itself from the wing. But American Airlines, as well as Continental Airlines and United Airlines, developed a different procedure that saved about 200 man-hours per aircraft and would reduce the number of disconnects of systems like the hydraulic and fuel lines, electric cables, and wiring from 79 to only 27. The new procedure involved the removal of the engine and pylon as a single unit, rather than individual components. United Airlines used an overhead crane to support the engine and pylon assembly during this process, but American and Continental used a forklift to accomplish this task. The problem with this method, particularly involving the forklift, is that if it was incorrectly positioned, the engine and pylon assembly would not be stable as it was being handled. This would make it rock like a seesaw and jam the pylon against the wing's attachment points. The operators of the forklift were guided only by hand and voice signals, since they couldn't directly see the junction between the pylon and the wing. The positioning of the forklift's forks had to be very, very accurate, otherwise structural damage would result. To make the situation even worse, the maintenance work on this particular DC-10 did not actually go smoothly. The mechanics had started to disconnect the engine and pylon as a single unit, but a shift change took place halfway through the job. During this time, though the forklift remained in position, the fork supporting the entire weight of the engine and pylon moved downward slightly due to the loss of hydraulic pressure associated with a forklift engine being shut off. This caused the pylon fittings and the wing to be misaligned, and when work was resumed, the pylon was jammed on the wing and the forklift had to be repositioned to fix the problem. Whether or not damage to the mount was caused by the initial downward movement of the engine, or the realignment attempt, couldn't actually be made clear. But regardless, the resulting damage, which wasn't serious enough or noticeable to cause an immediate failure, eventually evolved into fatigue cracking. Every single time that DC-10 took off, it got worse and worse and worse during the eight weeks that followed since the maintenance. Eventually, the damaged pylon could take no more, and it broke from the wing, taking the engine with it. The physics involved with it breaking mid-takeoff resulted in the other damage to the wing, which ultimately sealed the fate of Flight 191. This resulted in inspections of the rest of the DC-10 fleets. It was found that United Airlines' hoist approach actually was pretty harmless, but... Several DC-10s at both American Airlines and Continental showed signs of fatigue cracking from their forklift method. McDonnell Douglas stated that the company would not actually encourage this procedure due to the element of risk, but they also pointed out that they do not have the authority to either approve or disapprove the maintenance procedures of their customers. Which, in their defense, they're right. They don't have the ability to tell people who buy their planes how to maintain them. They can guide them, give them instructions, but once ownership of the aircraft passes over to the people that buy it, it's on them to make sure those planes are stable. 
this particular issue with the DC-10s had nothing to do with McDonnell Douglas' design. It was because of the way American and Continental were maintaining them. The NTSB also looked into why the plane had crashed even though it lost the engine. Because technically speaking, the DC-10 should have been able to fly even if one engine was gone. It had three of them after all. But it was revealed that due to the additional damage to the wings, the loss of hydraulic power, the loss of electrical power, the additional drag caused by the slats being locked into place, this is what resulted in the left wing stalling out. Had the engine separated cleanly, it's likely that the crew of Flight 191 would have been able to keep it in the air and make a safe emergency landing back at the airport. Still, there might have been ways to maneuver the DC-10 even with the damage that may have kept it in the air. The DC-10 actually incorporates two different warning devices that might have alerted the pilots to the impending stall. A slat disagreement warning light, which would have illuminated after the uncommanded retraction of the slats, and a stick shaker on the captain's control column, which activates close to stall speed. Both of these warnings were powered by an electric generator, driven by the number one engine, and both systems became inoperative after the loss of that particular engine. The first officer's control column was also not equipped with a stick shaker. The device was offered by McDonnell Douglas as an option, but American Airlines chose not to have it installed. In response to the accident, stick shakers for both pilots were made mandatory. Taking off with an engine out situation is actually a standard procedure, as the plane was already traveling too fast to stop it at that point. But the partial electrical power failure meant that the crew was unaware of the slat issue on the left wing, nor did they have a stall warning. The raising of the stall speed of the left wing meant that flying at takeoff safety airspeed caused the left wing to stall, while the right wing was still producing lift, making the plane bank sharply. Simulations conducted after the crash showed that had the pilot maintained excess airspeed, the accident probably wouldn't have happened, as he would have had enough lift even with the damaged left wing to still keep the plane level. Due to the slat issue in the wing, the NTSB also made it mandatory that slat relief valves should be installed in case of hydraulic line damage. This would help to prevent uncommanded slat retraction, like what happened on Flight 191. The accident painted the DC-10s in a very bad light. It was the worst aviation disaster in American history, and it had already happened after the cargo door issue caused the accidents of American Airlines Flight 96 and Turkish Airlines Flight 981. The public viewpoint was that the DC-10s were inherently dangerous, and many were afraid to fly on them, even though this particular accident had very little to nothing to do with the actual design ethos of the DC-10. It was a maintenance problem with American Airlines. Still, while the investigation was ongoing, the FAA suspended the type certificate for the DC-10, grounding them. It also enacted a special air regulation banning of the DC-10s from US airspace, which would prevent DC-10s from foreign countries flying into America at all. This grounding was rescinded later, once the FAA was satisfied that maintenance issues were the cause of the accident and not the actual design of the aircraft. On July 13th, 1979, the type certificate was restored, and the special air regulation repealed. The DC-10s were permitted to fly again. Even after the cargo door problem was fixed, the DC-10 continued to have a string of bad luck. It had another accident on November 28th, 1979, which was Air New Zealand Flight 901. This accident managed to kill 257 people, and only made the DC-10's reputation even worse. But this plane had run into a mountain, and it was caused by several human and environmental factors, again having nothing to do with the design of the DC-10. The aircraft was officially exonerated as the cause of the accident, but the public view of the aircraft still stood. McDonnell Douglas saw a significant hit to sales of DC-10s, though this was partially due to the recession that was going on at the time as well. And in terms of responsibility and blame for the loss of Flight 191, well, Earl Russell Marshall, who was chief of the crew of American Airlines' maintenance facility in Tulsa, he would go on to commit suicide the night before he was to be deposed by McDonnell Douglas attorneys. Ultimately, no one person, or even a group, was held financially or legally responsible for the accident. Though American Airlines would wind up paying out several settlements due to lawsuits filed by the victims' families. It would simply go on to be a hard lesson in their safety, and many changes were enacted that likely saved lives in the future. As for the DC-10, 
well, they did go on to serve for many more years. And in some ways, their public image improved over time. Like I said in the last video, their safety record actually isn't that dissimilar from pretty much every other passenger airliner of their time. They just had a very, very rough start and a string of bad luck. But one accident actually managed to redeem them in a weird way. Ten years after Flight 191, United Airlines Flight 232 also lost an engine, all its flight controls, and crash-landed in a huge fireball, which was caught on video. It killed 112 people, but 184 survived the accident. The investigation that followed praised the DC-1030 construction as being partly responsible for the high number of survivors. In truth, once their major flaw with their cargo doors was fixed, the DC-10s themselves were actually very good planes, and it was only due to inept and cheap maintenance conducted on them to save time and money that so many lost their lives on the day Flight 191 crashed. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my generous, generous underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, some dude 267, Brightline Blue Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Dark Lightning 1536, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.